following message is a presentation of Valley Metro Church, a community of believers dedicated to knowing God and making Him known. You know, I was just thinking of something um, about when you were a kid. You ever wake up in the morning thinking you just missed a test or something? Do you ever have that, where does that come from? That little window of school still has an effect on us later on. Sometimes I think I missed a test or something huge happened. But let me ask you this, when you were younger and it would come time for report cards, how did you feel about taking that report card and bringing it home to mom and dad? Kind of mixed emotions there, right? If you did good on your report card, that would be great. You would be fine. But you know, if you struggled in some areas, you're kind of, if you were like me, you're kind of shoving that thing somewhere and hoping they wouldn't ask for it. But eventually they would because they had to sign it. And they had to come to terms with the report card. And the report card was that one time where the school checks in very directly on how we're doing with our attitude, with our conduct, with our effort, with our grades and all these other kind of things. And I know I have five kids when they come get their report cards I usually sit down with them and we'll go over it. And, and when they do something good, when I see they've been trying, we, we just praise them for it. We say, great job. We reward them. We'll take them out to dinner or do something really cool. We'll celebrate the victories. But if there's something on there that needs to be addressed, we have to reel it in and we have to sit down and have a heart to heart. And there's got to be consequences for that, but praises for the good things. Let me ask you this. If you went home today, and you checked your mail, you went into your mailbox, and you found that you had a report card from God Almighty in your mailbox today. How would you feel about that? Would it be like, yes, I got my report card. It would be like, oh, I don't know if I want to open it. I mean, he might have some amazing things. He might have some things on that report card that would blow you away. He might say, I've seen how you've been struggling in these areas, and yet you've kept a great attitude awesome. I've been watching you and I've been watching how you're trying to reach out to that one person on the job who keeps shutting down and doesn't really, isn't respectful in their response to you and you keep pursuing. God might have some amazing things to tell you and I in a report card if we were to go home and open our mailbox and find a report card from God. And in all fairness, at the same time, there might be some things on a category. He might say, yeah, and about that, about that area, We need to tune that up. We need to reel that in a little bit. We gotta get a better course correction in your life in these other areas. And I I wanna bring up that idea, that, that principle, that understanding, because that is exactly what Jesus is doing in the book of Revelation with the churches in Revelation. And we're going through the book of Revelation. It's an amazing book. It explains our future, uh, what the future looks like for all of us. And um, it starts with Jesus addressing these seven churches in the book of Revelation. And just to understand this a little bit, because we might think, well, why are we talking about seven churches from 2,000 years ago? How does it affect me? Um, The way Revelation is written, um, it it clearly does apply to seven historical churches that really existed back in the day, modern-day Turkey, that really existed. Ephesus, the letter to the Ephesians in the Bible is one of them, and some of the others are less known to us, but they're, they're documented still. Now, these churches, they were real churches. They had real issues. They were doing some things great, some things not so great. Jesus addresses every single one, but here's what you gotta hold on to. It wasn't just seven historical churches. This message is spiritual and it is timeless and it applies to all churches all around the globe, everywhere, even today. You could look at churches today in our city. You might read some of these things about a church and go, wow, that sounds like our city. Our city acts like that. Or you might say, that sounds like this church, or maybe that part is us, and so it does apply to the churches today, we need to take that to heart, but it also applies to you and me individually. When you hear Jesus' report card on the churches, the good and the bad, the good, the bad, and the ugly, it's all in there, um, it applies to us too, because as I'm going through these churches myself, I read these things, and some things come up, and I'm like, yeah, I think the Lord's talking to me about that part too. And and I want to encourage you, there's probably in parts of your life that he really does want to praise you for. He really wants to acknowledge you. He really wants to say, I see you. Like the Lord said to Hagar in the Old Testament, she was wandering through the desert and the Lord's like, hey, I see you and I know where you're at and I see your struggle and what you're going through and I'm not going to leave or forsake you. The Lord sees you. He wants to empower you. He wants to encourage you. 
The Holy Spirit wants to come alongside you, to equip you, to comfort you, to counsel you, all these amazing things. That's very true. And yet at the same time, we all have to remain teachable because the day that we're not teachable is the day we stop growing. And some of the churches in Revelation, they they seem to stop being teachable because they stopped growing. And Jesus is saying, these things are great, but these things, guys... We got to reel it in. We got to tune this up. There's a much, life is too short and, you, and, and, and you've, you've pulled over in this area of your life or you've went in reverse. And so God is calling out these churches. And so today in Revelation 3, if you have your Bible or if it's on your phone, your device or however you read your word, uh, or there's one in the seat in front of you probably, but Revelation chapter 3, if you guys would open it up, we're going to be looking at the next church in our series here. And this is called the church of Sardis, Sardis. And this is the church that fell asleep. This church just flat out fell asleep. And you wonder, (laughs) how does that happen? I mean, how does a church fall asleep? How do a group of believers who believe in Jesus, the one who died on the cross and conquered death, the one who rose to life, the one who was the way, the truth, and the life, and people are following Jesus as the truth and the life, they're Christ followers, how did this group of people that was vibrant at one point in time somehow, some way, drift off and fall asleep? It's a worthy question because it can happen to any of us today. It can happen to churches today. Maybe you know some churches historically that were blowing up, that God was doing great things spiritually, very dynamic, very alive, but somehow, some way, they just kind of got rocked to sleep somehow. Maybe you have experience knowing about that. Or maybe that's happened in your life where you were, had a zeal and you were on fire for God, but you realized through a series of events or things you did or didn't do that you found yourself getting rocked to sleep a little bit. Or maybe you have some friends that were passionate for Jesus and they were running the race. They were fully alive in Jesus. But some stuff happened, maybe disappointment maybe unmet expectations, maybe God didn't do something they thought God should have done when God should have done it. And that kind of hurts when we go through stuff like that and people start to slip back and we see people that were so alive eventually start to drift to sleep. And that's what's going on in this church of Sardis. And why it's important because it can happen to a church, it can happen to you, it can happen to me. None of us are exempt from that. The Gospels tell us in the, in the New Testament, excuse me, it says, if you think you're standing so strong, be careful lest you fall. In other words, if any of us thinks, no, I'm good, <laughs> I have no issues, I'm not slipping anywhere on anything, I am strong and nothing's gonna mess up my walk, the Bible's saying if that's you, be careful because that's when we're prone to. So we gotta all be teachable, we gotta learn through this and we're gonna understand this. So to understand this town of Sardis, how did this happen, how did they fall asleep? Um, Some of it's speculation, but some of it we know from um, archeology, span we know some things about this town very clearly about the culture and the climate and it tells us something about these people because every church is in a culture. Every church is in a culture and the culture has an effect on the church, the church has an effect on the culture. And that's been true historically throughout time. It's true today here in LA. The culture has an effect on the church, on the people, not the building, on the people, the church. And the church has an effect on on the culture. And in this particular uh, city, we see that there were some ancient ruins and they had a massive stadium, a 20,000 person stadium, which is a big deal uh, for back then. It's an amazing stadium, which that tells us that they were very into their sports and they were very into their entertainment. Does that sound like anybody? Anybody into sports? Come on, honesty in God's house, no harm, no foul. Okay, if you got a sports team, you like. So they were very into their sports, they were very into entertainment. Our town is very into entertainment. This is where our town makes most of the entertainment around the world comes from our town. Uh, So that's what was going on with the culture of their environment. And they also had this enormous temple devoted to the Greek goddess Artemis, which was uh, responsible for nature and fertility. And so they worshiped this goddess, this Greek goddess, so that this goddess would bless them with fertility. So that was massive in the town and that had a big spiritual effect on the whole town. So you could say the town was spiritual but not walking in truth. Um, in LA, I would say there are a lot of people that would say, well, I'm spiritual, I'm spiritual, but they're maybe not walking in truth to who the one true living God is. So they're spiritual but misdirected in their spiritual pursuits. That's what's going on in this town as well. They also had many bathhouses, these bathhouse complexes, which tells me they, they really enjoyed their spas. 
They really enjoyed the back rub or getting their fingernails done or the, whatever it is. They, the spas were like a big thing. So they were super big on their comfort. Comfort was a priority to them. And it tells you something about the church. And the reason we need to know that is because something changed this church. Something changed this church. This church was walking with God. They had a zeal. They were a church. They're on the map. God's doing stuff. But over time, they're falling asleep. And we wonder, how did a church fall asleep? Somehow, something changed. I I think when I read this, I think they started putting a high priority on comfort. That their main decision things in life, the things that they were deciding personally as individuals and collectively as a church, was comfort. Whatever's going to make us the most comfortable, whatever's going to make me the most comfortable. And if you look at the early followers of Jesus, that was not their language. Jesus didn't say, I came so that you can be comfortable. I want you to be as comfortable as humanly possible. And I want you to make decisions that are going to be the most comfortable lifestyle that you could ever find. Jesus didn't say that. And yet the church seemed to start leaning in their, in their culture on entertainment, on spas, on this. It seemed to be that there was this big push towards, towards comfort, a high priority on comfort. And so uh, one thing I would say is that throughout history, guys, this is true in Sardis. It's true today in LA. It's true throughout all history of the church. Again, the church isn't the building, it's the people of God. We happen to assemble in a building, we call it the church, but the church is the people. Whether we're meeting in a park or under a palm tree or in a, in a warehouse, it's irrelevant. In a school, in a theater, it doesn't really matter. Even the early church met in rented halls or whatever they could find. Uh, but the point is this, all throughout history, we see a common theme, that the culture does affect the church or the church affects the culture. This has been going on for 2,000 years. And in times of revival, in times of awakening, the Bible talks about, I mean, uh, in history we have a great awakening and a second great awakening and we have these other revivals that have happened throughout time. Every time there's a revival, the church has a much bigger influence on the culture. But what happens when there isn't times of renewal and revival, that if the people of God aren't being strong, if they're not being intentional, if they're not aimed on walking with Jesus very intentionally, then what happens is the culture of the world washes over on the church. And the culture of the world begins to affect the church more than the church affecting the world. When you look at the book of Acts, the followers of Jesus, God was just blowing it up through Christ followers. And it was completely changing the world around them. Uh, you know, Paul was accused of going to these places and sparking these revivals, and they're talking about the followers of Jesus, and they said, these guys, these followers, they're turning the world upside down. That's the terminology that was used by people not in the church. The church is turning the world upside down. Why? Because the church was affecting the culture. But then you have other times where the church starts to maybe drift and get very comfortable and not really pursuing Jesus and walking with him, getting very comfortable, getting lulled to sleep, and what happens is the culture of the world has a much greater effect on the church, and that's where this passage is. So Revelation 3, uh, we're gonna start in verse one. We're gonna look at this in sections. And we're calling this, guys, we're calling this waking up to your mission because the bottom line is this. Here's the short version. God has called you into relationship with him, number one but he's called you into service too. He called you into relationship. He called you to come to him, but he also called you to go for him. Amen? Come to me, now go ye therefore. Come to me, grow, fall in love with God, understand his love, his nature, his mercy, his forgiveness. Get into relationship with the living God who's the lover of your soul. Know him and let everything come from that place of intimacy with God and a a renewed mind and a renewed heart and a fresh wind from his spirit. Let it come from that place and then from there, understand what he made you for. It's been said the greatest day in your life is the day when you're born and the next greatest day in your life is when you know what you were born for. And I would say the true is, same is true in God's kingdom. When you step into life with God through Jesus and you're born again, made new in the spirit, that's what it means. God gives you a fresh start in your spirit doesn't matter your age, you get a fresh start. That's the best day of your life because your eternity is different. It changes forever because you get born again or made new. You get regenerated in the spirit. And the next best day is when you know what you were made for, what God made you for. This church seemed to know, but they forgot and they fell asleep. So we're calling this waking up to your mission. 
Starts in Revelation chapter three, verse one, says this. To the angel of the church of Sardis write, these are the words of him who holds the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your deeds. You have a reputation of being alive, but you are dead. Wake up. Strengthen what remains and is about to die, for I have found your deeds unfinished in the sight of of my God, remember therefore what you have received and heard. Hold it fast and repent. But if you do not wake up, I will come like a thief and you will not know at what time I will come to you. So this starts out, Jesus is pictured holding seven spirits and seven stars. There's a lot of symbols in Revelation. Some people read them and get lost and it's understandable because what do these things all mean? I don't get it. But there's meaning behind all the symbols and we're gonna break them down as we go through the book of Revelation. Uh, We covered this part with the other churches. The seven spirits, seven is a number of completion. God made the world in six days. On the seventh, they rested, and then it was a new week. Seven is a complete, full number. It's a a, a number of completeness and perfection. And so when he's talking about the seven spirits, uh, the Old Testament refers to this as well, and it gives the seven perfect attributes, the natures, the, 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 the aspects of the Holy Spirit. And Jesus is saying, I've got the fullness of the Holy Spirit in one hand, and I've got the seven stars, and the seven stars are the, the, some would say, angels or the pastors or messengers of the churches, the leadership teams of the churches. Jesus is holding the leadership of the church accountable for the condition of the church, and he's holding the fullness of the Holy Spirit in his two hands. And that's the way he speaks with these in his hands. It's a pretty cool um, picture if you can get a hold of that. And... Uh, To most of the churches in Revelation, he starts out with some praise because we've gone through some of these churches. He's like, I've been watching you. You guys are so good about this. The way you're loving people is great. The way you guys have been faithful and not quitting. And he says that with a lot of churches. This church, unfortunately, he does not start out with any praise. Uh, This one, he gets right to the point, which makes this church kind of a a bit of a shocker, at least on this uh, aspect. And he says this. He says, I know you works that you have a reputation, which means you have a name, you have a name for being alive. Maybe they're called the living church. Maybe that's their name, the living church. They're supposed to be alive. They have a reputation and they have a name for being alive, but you are dead, he says. I don't know about you, but that would, that would be a shocker if, if I got that in the report card from God when I got home. You got this reputation but for being alive, but there's no life. This church somehow, guys, got lulled and rocked to sleep. Somehow, over time, leadership wasn't doing anything. The people were falling asleep. Just everybody was falling asleep. The church is supposed to be alive, but Sardis is lifeless. That's what's going on here. And it's full of people who are Christians. Listen, they have a name for being alive. They have a reputation for being alive, but they're not alive. That's telling us they have the name of being a Christian, but they don't have the lifestyle of being a Christian. Does that make sense? They have the name. There's a lot of people who wear a cross, throw something on their bumper, or would say, out of all the world religions, which one do you pick? Well, I got Buddha, Confucianism, Hinduism, Islam. Yeah, Christianity, I'll go with that one. Christianity for 100. I'll take Christianity. And they would pick that one out of all the religions, because that's the one they're inclined to or they're raised in an American culture or maybe when they were a little a kid, their mom took them to church or their grandma and so they go, yeah, out of those, I'm, I'm Christian. But these guys too would call themselves Christian. They're in a church. He's talking to believers, in theory, believers, people who assemble in, a, in some kind of gathering who say they are Christian, but he's saying that you guys have a a reputation for life, but there is no life. So the way we would read this is that this church is full of Christians in name only. And let's uh, point out some really key things here. If you're a note taker, I would encourage you to write these down on um, on the handout this morning or in your phone. But these are really some key points if you wanna understand waking up to your mission, how I wake up to my mission, and how this church of Sardis needed to wake up to their mission. It's coming to terms with the words of Jesus because he is speaking, he's trying to speak life into the church. He's trying to speak life into his people. And they can either hear it, have ears to hear what the Spirit is saying, or they can shut down. And that's been the case throughout history. Jesus trying to speak life into people who either have ears to hear what the Spirit of God is saying, 
or they don't have ears to hear and they shut down uh, and they go, uh, they, they go deaf on, on, on what God is trying to wake them up to. The first point is this, and this is really important, guys, is there are many who are Christians in name but not in nature. There are many who are Christians in name, but not in nature. And, and maybe you know some people that would call themselves Christians, but maybe there's nothing about their lifestyle that would reflect that. And we can't tell people who's going to heaven or hell. Jesus will do that. We can tell them how to get there. The Bible tells you this is what you gotta do. But we don't know what God's gonna do. We're gonna let, let him be the judge and not us. But the ultimate thing is we will know them by their fruit, there's either fruit in their life that looks like a Christ follower or that doesn't look anything like a Christ follower, but there's still many people that would call themselves Christian by name uh, and would, would, uh, would say that they're in the camp of, um, they say they're Christians in name, but not in their nature. Their nature doesn't reflect it. And that's really important because this church of Sardis didn't come to terms with that. They thought their name was good enough. And Jesus is like, oh no, I know about your name. I know about the, the name you guys have. But the nature just isn't there, guys. And that's really important. He says this in verse two, and this really, <clears throat> this stood out to me, and I want to kind of camp out on this principle. Verse two, he's like, here's the deal, guys. You're supposed to be alive, you're dead. And then he drops the bomb, so to speak. He goes, guys, your deeds, your deeds, the deeds that you were designed to do, they're all unfinished. You just, you just dropped it all. You left it. You stopped. There was a time when Israel was rebuilding the wall when they came back after Babylonian captivity. They come back and they're starting to build a city and they start doing some things and then they got discouraged and they dropped their trowels. The trowels that you do your brickwork, they just dropped them. Everybody went home to their own house to do their own stuff and, and so much time went on. And it's like, well, they got discouraged. They quit. And then God said to him through the prophet, what are you doing? Everyone's worried about their comfort in their house. Would you get back to building something that God was gonna bless? And guess what? They came back and they built it in record time because they were motivated and they heard what God was calling them to build. And that was really important. But this church, they fell asleep. It says their deeds are unfinished. That, that, would, that would be pretty uh, you know, sad to know that, wow, God called me to do a bunch of stuff or a few key things or some very simple things with some clear things and I just dropped my trowel and walked. Like, I got stuff to do. I'm going to the gym. I got to go see a movie. I got to watch my sports team. And then I'm going to the spa. And then I'm going to my, you know, and it's like, I got all my stuff to do, Jesus. I ain't doing that. And that's what Sardis did. Sardis drifted into comfort. And it says, your deeds are unfinished. That means that you and I actually have deeds assigned to us by God. This is important because if you want to know what you were made for, Number one, you were made to be in relationship with God. Number one, to be in love relationship with God who loves you more than anyone you know, who knows you better than you know yourself. In fact, we don't even know who we are until we know who he is. Because when you understand who he is, we begin to know ourselves better. So if you're on a quest of discovery and fully understanding who am I, you gotta know God first before you know who you really are. And uh, the Bible tells us that we're not saved by any of our works. There's nothing you and I can ever do that is gonna earn us a place in heaven or salvation. The Bible's real clear. We have it for the screen, Ephesians 2.10. We are God's handiwork. Some of your translations might say we're God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. This passage in its context says fully, you read what comes before it, that we're not saved by any works. There's no works that you and I can do. Uh, I was raised Catholic. I was told you got to do this, and then you got to do a, uh, you know, um, you know, the communion, and then I got to do the confirmation, then I got to do this, and then I got to do that. And, and all these things are not guaranteeing it, but they're leaning you towards, you know, heaven, but no guarantee. It might be purgatory, you know, um, but, but there's steps you got to take, and there's other people trying to do more good deeds by doing things to earn their way like a ladder. The Bible says it can't be done. There is nothing you and I could ever do to earn ourselves favor with God, to earn admittance to heaven and eternity. It's a free gift of God's grace that we receive by faith. And in the same breath of saying that, Ephesians 2 verses 8 and 9 say that, there's nothing you could do to work your way there. It's free, it's free, it's free, it's free. That's what grace is. Grace plus anything is not equal to grace. It's free, it's free, it's free. Heaven is free, it's a free offer. You receive it by faith for what Jesus did for you and I. That's the beauty. And in the very next breath, 
in the same context passage, he says, now that you understand how you have heaven for free, and it's a gift and you can't earn it ever, understand this in the same breath. You were made for good works. That's the context. That's full biblical context. It's free, you can't earn it, don't even try. But once you accept God's love and his offer by faith, Understand also that you were made for good works and I was made for good works. We're his handiwork, we're his workmanship. It's an amazing term. Um, created in Christ Jesus, the reason he brought us in and created us after being in love with him and being restored and being forgiven and having heaven is for good works. And it said he prepared them in advance for us, which means while you were being made in your mother's womb, God's like, this is great. He understood your DNA. He understood the spiritual gifts he was sprinkling in there, all the cool things that he was putting into the matrix of your life, natural and spiritually. And he already knew what was going there. And he's like, I've got some great things planned for this one. Oh, I got some great things planned for this one. And he's got these things built into the fabric of our soul that we're supposed to discover and begin to walk out. That's what this is talking about. He created us to do good works, which he prepared in advance. Now, when it talks about good works, the Greek word here suggests that God has for each one of you and for me, he has actions. He has actions. He's got deeds. He's got jobs. He has roles for us to do, certain roles, certain functions, certain assignments, certain certain service. He doesn't have anything overwhelming for you and I. He has nothing for us we can't handle. He says, my yoke is easy, my burden is light. He never gives us more than we can handle. It's not like you walk out of church and, wow, what's my big to-do list? But it is pray and go, God, what did you make me for? What did you make me for? And I will tell you one thing. When you look at what God made you for, it's to come to terms with not be Christian in name, but be Christian in nature also, as we said the first one. And the second one is to understand, is our second point this morning, if you're a note taker, is that I was saved to serve and I was made for mission. I was saved to serve. I was saved to serve God. And I know what my life was like and I know I was serving myself for a lot of years, many years, too many years. I know I was doing that, but when God woke me up, I realized, wow, I am yours, I'm not my own. I was bought with a price and guess what? I was saved to serve God. I wasn't saved to serve myself. But this church in Sardis, they seem to be serving themselves so focused on their comfort that it just kind of rocked them into a sleep. And Jesus is like, what did you do, guys? You, you're supposed to be alive, but you, you fell asleep and you dropped your trowels and you just walked away and everybody went to the spa or went to the game and never came back again. And Jesus is like, are you a church? You're a church in name, but are you guys believers? Are you Christ followers? And that's what he's talking to these guys about. So he prepared these things in advance for them and for you and for me. I was safe to serve and I was made for mission. It's important to know that. We weren't made for our own comfort. If our lifestyle, if our aim in life is, I want heaven and other than that decision I made a long time ago, it's all about my comfort. If our aim is like, my comfort level, the nicest of everything I could get. If that's our aim, the Bible says that's a carnal mindset and we're missing the kingdom of God. Now, God may bless you with nice things. And if he does, he blesses you with nice things so you could bless others. And if he does bless you with nice things, thank him for blessing you with nice things. God doesn't have a problem with nice things. It's not what you have in life that matters, it's where it's at that matters. When we elevate these things and we aim at them and go at them, then we're missing the whole point of being a Christ follower. And yet, as you're a Christ follower, God may or may not bless you with a lot of nice things. Understand your stewardship of those things. That's really important. But this church forgot. They put their focus, it seems, on comfort. And he's telling them, guys, you're supposed to be alive, but you're lifeless. Now, here's what's interesting about this. Outside the city of Sardis, It's been said that outside the city, it's about seven miles away, but I guess it starts to go up on a a little hill. So when you're in the city, you can look out at this hillside, and they had one of the biggest cemeteries of the whole area, biggest graveyard in that whole part of the world. So there was thousands and thousands of people with tombstones outside the city. And we could be in the city talking like this, but we could look out on this little hill, and from a distance, we could still see all these like, memorial stones, these tombstones. So when Jesus is telling Sardis, guys, you're supposed to be alive, but just like right outside your city, a graveyard, he goes, spiritually, that's what you guys are like. And for them, they should have understood, wow, 
I fully get that. I pass that thing every day, and I understand what Jesus is talking about. He's got my attention fully clear, eyes wide open. I fully get it. Uh, Even though they were living dead, that should have woken them up. I know it would have woken me up. Every time I'm asked to minister at a funeral, it has a way of shaking me into the shortness of life and how we live and why we live and what we live for. And and when you're doing a eulogy or other people are sharing about somebody's life, sometimes you hear amazing things, sometimes you hear sincere things, and you you hear all these different things about somebody's life. And sometimes people have a lot to say about somebody, and sometimes they don't really have that much to say about them. They're just trying to honor the person. And maybe you've been to you know, services like that, the pendulum swings as far as that person, what was their nature, what was their character. If their nature and character were godly and they were not a self-seeking person, if they were other-centered, people had a lot of great things to say about them. But if they were self-centered and focused on their comfort, there's really not as many great things to say about a person like that. But every time I do uh, a service like that or I'm attending one, it kind of shakes me. And I feel the Spirit of God saying, get more fully alive. Get more alive. Me. And you'd say, well, pastor, I'm already alive. How alive are we? (laughs) On your report card, and on mine, from God, if we went home and got it in the mailbox, on the category of being fully alive, would we have a 100? As my daughter says, A plus 100. A plus 100. We have an A plus 100 in being fully alive. We have a B minus, C, D. I mean, where are we at on the fully alive thing? Spiritually. I know pulse-wise, our, we probably have good health and we're probably doing great there, but spiritually, how alive are we? Because this church was fully alive in the natural, but not fully alive in the spirit. And it can happen to people in a church just like these guys. It's important, guys. It's important to know, and I realize this too when I go up and down that 405. How many of you guys drive the 405 at all, okay? When you go down up that 405 and you see on the right side that VA cemetery, massive VA cemetery right there, right after um, Sunset Boulevard right there, you can't miss it. It's enormous. When I go by that and I see the thousands upon thousands of perfectly, perfectly aligned, you know, memorial stones throughout there, I realize... Those people were just like me. They got up in the morning and put their shoes on and had breakfast just like we did, comb your hair or whatever. Just like us, no different. Some of them probably prayed. Some of them didn't. Some of them honored God. Some of them didn't. They're all different. I don't know. All I know is I have the opportunity to live and they don't anymore. And when I pass that, it reminds me, I sense the Lord saying, get more fully alive. Like, come alive even more. I believe you can be alive but not fully alive, spiritually speaking. And, and I think when there's revival, people step into the fullness of life God has and sometimes the church, even though they call themselves Christians, start to get rocked into a deeper and deeper sleep. And Jesus is like, I know you say that in name, but that's not the nature. And that's what's going on here. It's not our duration of life that matters most. It's our donation in life that matters most. What we gave away, how we lived. It's not how long we lived, it's how we lived. How we lived is what matters. Jesus called us to come to him, but he also tells us to go for him. And so when you think about your contribution in life, I don't know what people are gonna say on the day that we are, you know, um, they're doing a memorial service or a going home service for us. I don't know what people are gonna say But I think it's important to think about that at least a little bit. What will they say about you? What will they say about me? Will they talk about being selfless and God-centered and other-centered in a way where we made a contribution and we gave life? I'd say the best way you can serve God is by serving others. The best way you can serve God is by serving others with the love of God. It's the best way you can serve God. And we'll either have a life where we serve God and we help people we helped them out of the mire because we were in the mire too. We helped them out of the mud and we were in the mud too. And we helped, you know, point them to Jesus and kind of clean them up a little bit just like we got tuned up and show them God's love and help them walk. And, and pretty soon they kind of put down their spiritual crutches and walk on their own and pretty soon they're running the race and you're like, yeah, that was awesome. That's what it's about right there. And then going back and helping somebody else in some kind of way, serving God and serving others. Or will our life be about our, our comfort we're, we're not building anything to help other people across. When I lived in uh, New York City, I lived there till I was 14. I was born there. And uh, 
there was this bridge that goes from my part of the city, Staten Island, over to Brooklyn. Uh, it was called the Verrazano Bridge. And this bridge, we'd go over it all the time when we would visit my grandmother. And uh, I have to admit, one time, my father, he was a fireman. He had to go pick up one of the big fire trucks getting serviced. And I guess they drew lots to who had to do it. My father had to go pick up the truck. Well, me and my brother went with him in the, driving over to, to Brooklyn, and we picked up this fire truck. And I remember we were coming back across the Verrazano Bridge just with your dad in a fire truck. Now, if you're a kid, this is like cool. This is epic. You're driving a fire truck over this bridge in New York City, right? And th- there's these buttons right there, and I'm just salivating to hit these buttons, which is lollipop lights coming on and siren and stuff. I'm like, Dad, can we hit it? And, and, and he looked over at me and my brother. He's like, okay, go ahead. And we're in New York City, right over that Verrazano Bridge, right in the middle of, you know, these two parts of the city. And for a moment, we just got to hit these lights. Woo! This thing is lit up and everything. It was really fun. I know you'd have to be there, but it was cool for me as a memory as a kid, being able to light it up in a fire truck. But this bridge, there's people going back and forth all day long, but many spiritually have no idea where they're going. I want you to think about something. If you were to be used by God and you were to live a lifestyle that actually mattered so much, not just for you and your eternity and your love for God, that is beautiful and it's where it all begins. But I'm talking about for others. God used you to f- affect others, to bless others, to help others. Think about what you could build when we talk about deeds and doing things for God's glory. What kind of thing you could build to help take people from here to over here, to take them out of darkness into God's light, to take them out of being lost to being found, to take them out of being blind to being able to see. I found a picture of that Verrazano Bridge last night. I think we have a graphic of it. Um, this, is new, this is the Verrazano Bridge in New York, and this is a marathon they did. And I had to get that picture because I'm blown away with that picture because there's literally hundreds of thousands of people getting from one part of the city to another on a bridge. And I think we have another shot of that bridge as well. Um, But when you think about this, when you think about this, there are thousands of people in life going north, south, east, and west, but having no idea where they're going spiritually. What if God used you to be a a bridge builder? What if God used you to build bridges in life? Build bridges. Build bridges just to help people from here to there. Because that's what the apostles did. That's what Paul's doing. That's what John's doing. That's what all these guys are doing. They love God. They serve God by serving us. And they help people, help take them from there to there. How would you like to be like that Verrazano Bridge? Where at the end of your life, you actually helped bring, it might not be thousands. What if it's 10? What if it's 100? What if it's five? How cool would that be that God used you to help take people from one place to another because you were willing to build a bridge? Someone had to build that bridge. It took work. It took work. They weren't building it for themselves. They were building it for others. And it outlived the people who built it. And it's been given life ever since and blessing people. But think about that. When you see that illustration, it reminds me of, boy, there's a lot of people out there that, that really don't have truth and spiritual direction. And you and I can build these bridges because we were made for good works. And if we're going to find out what these works are, One great way is by serving God is to serve others and help take them from one place to another. That's amazing to me. But each of us does have a gift. Each of us does have a purpose. Each of us does have a calling. When God called you, he gave you a mission. And my prayer today is that we begin to to wake up to our mission and begin to understand uh, our mission. And the last things I want to cover this morning is that Jesus doesn't leave them in this condition. He tells this church, look, guys, there's a spiritual condition with you guys. This particular church, Sardis, they fell asleep. They drifted. Uh, Somehow the drumbeat of the world kind of rocked them to sleep. The culture of the world kind of rocked them right to sleep. And Jesus has a cure for those who have spiritually fallen asleep. And I want to go over these pretty quickly. But uh, it'd be our third point this morning. Is you you gotta choose to wake up. Waking up spiritually is a choice. Um, God tries to wake us up spiritually, and yet we have this choice to wake up or not. Just like in the morning when your alarm goes off, how many of you guys honestly hit the snooze again? Come on, right? There's something about being able to hit it 
maybe some of you hit it twice or three, that's when it gets to be a problem. Three or four times. Maybe you have a second alarm somewhere else because it's hard to get up. Everyone's got a different routine. No judgment here, family. However you wake up, that's fine, whatever it takes. But the the point is, sometimes we hit that thing and we hit that thing. We have to choose to hear the call of God and and wake up. We have to choose to. Or we can just keep hitting the snooze. And some people hit it their whole life. Yeah, someday I'll get right with God, but I'm doing it this way. And so we got to choose to wake up. That's first. It is a choice because God is calling us. He says, draw near to me and I will draw near to you. And when we say yes to God's calling and the pull of his Holy Spirit, when we respond, that's where we enter into life with him. But that's also where our life as Christians gets renewed. I know I have to go back often and say, God, call me to another level of life. Wake me up. I want to be, sometimes we can be awake but not seeing what we need to be seeing. And we ask God to wake us up to a greater level of clarity and understanding and calling and purpose. Uh, the, the next thing he says, and it'll be our fourth point this morning, specifically for those who have spiritually fallen asleep, is choose to repent. Repent is this word we don't use a lot. It simply means turn. And it really means, instead of just changing our behavior, it really means change our mind. Because if, if we try to change our behavior and we don't really change our mind, then we're just trying to modify our behavior, and that's really not what the heart of God is about. Uh, The Jewish Pharisees had a lot to do about modifying their behavior on the outside, and Jesus is like, yeah, but I see your heart. That's not what your heart is, guys. You're just kind of doing this show with the behavior, but the heart matters. And so if we're going to repent, we've got to change our mind. If we change our mind, we will change our ways. We'll change our direction if we change our mind and our heart. And specifically, these guys, they needed to turn from their laziness. This was a flat-out lazy church. The group of people in Sardis were lazy. They fell asleep. They dropped their trowels. They stopped serving God in any kind of way, and there were no deeds. And Jesus is like, wow, all the stuff I made you for, you guys quit a long time ago. And all this legacy and the great things and this fruit that was supposed to come out of your life, it just stopped. And so uh, choose to repent and turn from laziness is the next step for those who have spiritually fallen asleep. Uh, the next one is this, guys. It's, he says, these are the words of Jesus, strengthen what remains, strengthen what remains. What's cool about this is if you've ever done anything before, if you've ever done like, say something, uh, an instrument, if you played an instrument before when you were younger, or you did something physical where you were a dancer or, or uh, you know, a runner or anything or lifted weights or whatever it was that you might have done in life, if you did martial arts or something, if you've built those muscles and you develop those techniques, Even though we've slipped back, the cool thing about God's design is muscle has memory. Do you guys realize that? Muscle has memory. That's a cool thing built in by God because your muscle has memory. It's not as hard to get back there as it was to originally get there because your muscle will remember and help you. If you used to ride a bike, you can get on one after you haven't ridden in 20, 30 years. If you used to ride a horse, you can do that again. If you used to play a guitar, it's going to take a little bit to get there, but muscle has memory. If you used to run, you can get back into run. It's going to take you a while, but your body was there. And he's saying the same spiritually. Whatever you got left in there, start there. Whatever little bit of spiritual life, Sardis, that you have going, start there. Start to strengthen what little bit you got. Don't go, well, I need this and I need this. No, start with what you got. We all got to start with ground zero right here. We got to start with ground at zero. Me, myself, and I. What did God give me? What did he put in me? What does he expect of me? Not worry about other people or other things or what we don't have. We got to strengthen what remains right here. That's part of the the cure for those of us who can fall spiritually asleep. And the next one he says to them is hold to the word. There was a point in this church's life where they used to actually esteem the word of God. In the beginning days, and Lately, they're just talking about how they feel or what they think or what's their opinion. And they're, what about the word? What about the word of God in, in the church that he's given us everything we need for life and godliness? It's all spirit breathed. This is, this is for our benefit. This is like our foundation. And, and this church kind of just took the word and started focusing on other conversations. And there are churches today, sadly, even in America, who don't really reference the word a whole lot. They just don't. There are churches today that don't even believe the word of God. At first, I don't know why. They used to think it had authority, and then all of a sudden they feel like they've evolved. And they evolved themselves above the word of God, and now they feel the word of God doesn't have authority. And so they talk about other things. Let me tell you, the word of God always has authority. In fact, the Bible says this word won't return void. 
that when we see him face to face, the word of God's gonna accomplish everything he set it out to do. Everything else is gonna pass away. Flowers, lilies, trees, buildings, but the word of God will never pass away. This church somehow didn't hold on to the word anymore. They just kind of ditched it or stuck it somewhere and talked about other cultural things they wanted to talk about. They were missing it totally. Jesus is like, here, the cure to wake up is get back and hold to the word. And he says this to them, the last thing he says to them. He says, finish your work. Isn't that interesting? Finish your work. Finish what you started. You had these deeds. You stopped. You just dropped it all. Like Israel, go back, pick up your trowel again and build what I made you to build. God's not gonna ask you to build something crazy you can't build. He's not asking you to build that, that bridge that goes over to Brooklyn. He's not asking you to actually build something like that. But spiritually, he's asking you to build some things. He's asking you to invest your time and talent and direction into things that will translate to people falling in love with God, to, to helping reach people and help people and, and, and encourage them along in the life and their journey so that they too could fall in love with Jesus. You know, I don't know what your work is, but I do pray this morning that we all, even as, 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 as those who are here in a, in a Bible-believing church, that we will wake up to a whole nother level of our mission, not just to the idea of following God, but literally wake up to a level of mission uh, because I believe that's what God is calling us to. And this passage ends with blessing, blessing for those who, who get it. There's some people in this church of Sardis who were, who were living right. There were some. The majority was going one way. And it says this in verse four. Talking to the church of Sardis, Revelation three, verse four says, yet you have a few people in Sardis who have not soiled their clothes. They will walk with me dressed in white, for they are worthy. The one who is victorious will, like them, be dressed in white, and I will never blot out the name of that person from the book of life, but will acknowledge that name before my Father and his angels. Whoever has ears, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So, again, he's talking to some of those who are not just Christian in name, but they're also Christian in lifestyle, some of those ones. He said, you guys are gonna be richly rewarded. And what he's gonna do, and this principle comes up throughout scripture, this idea of wedding clothes. There's gonna be a wedding feast with the lamb, Jesus the lamb of God, where there's gonna be the celebration into eternity that is gonna be better than any, no mind has imagined, no ear has heard, no heart's conceived, no one can ever even get their head around even the beginning of what eternity is gonna be like. The Bible says you can't even explain it. That's how amazing it is. Revelation gives us some little pictures and we're like, what does that mean? Bible's like it's beyond anything you could imagine. Eternity is that great. And it's gonna begin with this celebration with Jesus. It's a wedding feast with the lamb where Jesus comes back for his people. And the way it worked in Israel is only the, the groom's family, the groom would be the one to give you the wedding clothes. You know, you go to those fancy hotels and if they might put an initial or something on, you know, like that, it's kind of like that. It's like, Jesus is gonna give wedding clothes and he shares a parable of somebody who's in the wedding and Jesus is like, where'd you get, where's your clothes? You can't be in here without the wedding clothes. The point is Jesus is gonna give wedding clothes to all of those who lived in a way, not a perfect life, but a life that tried to honor God and say, God, I love you and in response for everything you've done to me, I know I was made for good works. I simply want to walk in them. I want to serve others by serving you. I don't want to be self-centered. I don't want to just say, bless me, but more comfort, more comfort, more comfort, more comfort. And they stop asking God to serve them. God is not made that we might, that he might serve us. We were made that we might serve God. And yet sometimes we just want God to serve us and get us more comfort and more comfort and more stuff and more comfort. And, And it's like, he would say, don't, I know LA is like that and Western civilization is like that. And, but he would say, don't, don't let that rock you to sleep like Sardis. He's calling you out. He's calling me out. He's calling us to be fully, fully awake. And at this wedding feast, by the way, instead of there being a wedding registry that you sign your name into, like most weddings, you walk up and you sign the book. At this one, you're gonna walk up to the book of life. You're gonna open it. You're gonna see your name written in that book of life. And Jesus said, I personally am gonna proclaim you to the fathers and the angels in heaven. You're gonna say, Lord, this is Joey right here. Remember, we've been watching him and with him all along, and he's been... He's been all about 
loving us and loving other people. This is him. And the father and the angels are saying, yeah, that's awesome. And taking the next guest, this is what the picture is here at the wedding feast, taking the next guest, and he is acknowledging you and me before the father and angels in heaven. This is the picture of our future, what it looks like here. So in closing, as the worship team comes up, I just want to encourage you guys, I have to do this as well. I'm not exempt from any of this message, guys. I'm a student of the word just like you are, and I'm, I'm being challenged in this stuff too. And some of these messages to the churches, they're kind of wake-up calls because we're reminded of what matters in life and what doesn't. And I would just encourage you, beware of the things that rock you to sleep. Beware of the things in this culture that begin to rock you to sleep. Because the devil would love nothing more. He can't take our salvation away from us. But if he could just get us sleepy, if he could just get us sleepy. How many of you guys have ever rocked a baby to sleep? Anybody ever done that? Okay, I got five. I'm pretty good at it. I got, got the bounce. There's the daddy bounce. You got to get this little bounce thing going on and they fall asleep. You know, but everyone's got their thing, their groove or what they do to get the little baby to sleep. But the point is, The enemy, who is real, would love nothing more than to rock you and I to sleep. Find some way that even though we're alive in theory, that we're somewhat sedated so that we're not fully alive. Even though that we're we're technically awake, we're not fully, fully aware. He would love to do that because if he could get us just to be a little sedated and uh, slightly sleepy, we're going to miss out on the, the fullness of what God has and I would say also, be, care of, be, be careful of a focus on comfort, a focus on comfort. And that's hard because we live in a life where they say the reward is, you know, get a car or get a better car or get, a, get an apartment or get a condo and then get a house and then get a better house. I mean, this is what society says and this is how society evaluates things and this is how our culture has an effect on the church instead of our church having an effect on the culture. I want to say there's nothing wrong with things. There's nothing wrong with nice things. There's nothing wrong with wealth. But it's the placement of these things and how we pursue them and how we lift them up at idols that does matter. And this church began to focus on their comfort. The comfort was the driving factor in their life. And if it didn't fit into their comfortable schedule, I ain't doing it. If it didn't fit into their comfortable, I ain't serving. If it didn't fit into their comfortable... Nope, not this season of life. I got to be about my business. I got stuff to do. And, and this church somehow got rocked to sleep instead of saying, wait, <laughs> I'm not even my own. I don't belong to me. Do you know that? You don't belong to you. If you're in Jesus, you don't belong to you. I am not my own. I've been bought with a price. And the life I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God who died and gave himself for me. We're not our own. We're not our own. But sometimes we think we are and we kind of put God to the side and we focus on the comfort. These guys did and they fell asleep on their mission. My prayer is that we would fully waken to our mission. How many of you guys want to fully waken to the mission? Amen, that's a good place to start. Let's close in prayer this morning. Mighty God, we love you so much. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the power of it. God, we just want to ask this morning, God, that you would begin to seal some of these things in our hearts. I want to pray, Father, this morning that... um, The mission begins with you, Lord, with getting intentional with you, getting intentional with our relationship with you, um, and not being um, just Christian in name, Lord, but being Christian in nature. And so, Lord, I just want to pray for for us this morning, Lord God. I just, I sense you might be calling some into, um, into relationship with you right now. And that matters more than anything. I mean, eternity is based on our relationship with you. Even our present life is based on our relationship with you. So just with everybody's um, eye closed and head bowed, if you just sense the Lord calling you into relationship this morning, he's just saying, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. I am the life. There is no life outside of me. And he's saying, come to me. Come to me. Come to me, all of you who are weary and have a heavy load, and I'll give you rest. You're all about having to settle down at your feet, getting rest, getting renewed, getting strengthened, learning how to love you back. And then from there, a place to go out and begin to understand our gifts and our calling and to serve you. With everybody's eyes closed and head bowed, if you sense the Lord's calling you into relationship, I just want to agree with you in prayer. Just raise your hand this morning if you feel the Lord's calling you into that place of, amen. Anybody else this morning? Lord's pleased with you. Yes, Lord's pleased. Anybody else this morning where the Lord's calling you into 
calling you into a relationship with him, the King of all kings, the Lord of lords. Anybody else this morning? Amen. The Lord's pleased. Anybody else this morning? It's time to wake up fully. Hallelujah. God is so good. Anybody else this morning? God is so good. Well, let's agree and and say this just in the privacy of your own heart, saying, Jesus, I want to wake up fully to everything you have for me. I want to throw off the world and my own sin that's been rocking me to sleep and the devil who's been trying to rock me to sleep. I want to have ears to hear what your spirit's saying to your churches, God, to me personally. And I want to step into an intimate relationship with you, God. I believe you died for my sin on the cross. I believe you rose from the grave. I want to turn and follow you in a new way, in a new level of life. Not just with my brain, but with my heart. Not just with my, uh, what I learned somewhere, but with my life. I want to turn and follow you. And Lord, I have ears to hear what your spirit's saying this morning, and that's why I'm responding to you. So Lord, put your spirit in me. And Lord, bring me fully alive. Bring me alive on a whole nother level. Give me eyes to see things I never saw before. Give me a heart to sense things I never saw before. And I pray that your Holy Spirit begin to heighten things in our life that could have never happened aside from a move of your spirit, Lord. We just thank you for that, what you're doing, Father, in Jesus' name. And Lord, everybody else in this room, Lord, I pray that we would all come fully alive to the mission and the things you're calling us to. Not to give us a do list, Lord, because we don't serve out of this burden or obligation. We serve out of opportunity. So give us that mindset and that attitude to serve you with an opportunity. We love you so much, Lord. We love you so much. We just thank you for what you're doing in our lives. In Jesus' name. This has been a presentation of Valley Metro Church. To hear more messages or to support future podcasts, please visit us at valleymetrochurch.com.